um, actual payments webinar, please note that these webinars are actually posted on the CBPIP website. So if you have missed any of the others or any of the future ones going forward, we will finish. We're going to continue with this two week um, series until about the 15th of December. And as a result, if you'd like to catch up on some of the ones that you might have missed, they are all available. The presentations as well as the recording is on the CBPEP website, which is just www.cbpep.org. We will be sending out an evaluation form within the next two to three days, just to get some of your comments and your feedback so that we also know if we're on track going forward with the balance of the payment series as well. Um, so with that in mind, it's about four minutes past. I don't see anybody joining us at the moment. I think we can actually go ahead with the session. So essentially, we've set up this government to person payment series, um, and it really is about how we start to digitize payments in the public sector, not just in the public sector, because if we do it in the public sector, we'll create spillovers in the rest of the economy. And that's essentially what we're trying to achieve through this process. So as a result of that, um, how we got to this point, for those of you that have not been part of our earlier conversations, you'll know that uh, when COVID hit, we uh, decided to introduce the SRB 350 grant through the presidency and had to figure out how we could actually um, introduce government to person payments, but in a digital format and not having to appear in person as a result of COVID and social distancing. Um, as well, the presidency started in the early part of last year to think about how we start to improve um, employment given the impact of the pandemic. And as a result of that, we uh, rolled out the presidential employment stimulus. And while SASA doesn't have a lot of challenges on how it can actually onboard and pay beneficiaries, um, some of the departments that we'll be hearing from today or institutions actually had to pivot relatively quickly. And we're going to hear specifically today from Dalrod and how they actually managed to pivot quite quickly to roll out a grant to agricultural farmers. So the reason we've actually hosted this webinar series is really just to try and see what is happening in the rest of the world around payments how is the digitization of payments actually enabling e-government services more broadly? But how does it ensure that the first, the middle, and the last mile of the payments value chain is actually digitized and automated to a large extent? And so the first two sessions, we've had very interesting presentations from India and Turkey. And uh, last two weeks ago, we actually listened to presentations regarding uh, Bangladesh and Indonesia. And today we're actually going to listen to the South African story. Um, we've also got pockets of excellence and we'll be drawing on some of our experts in our own country, specifically talking to SASA. We're also going to be talking to SARS as well as, um, as Dalrad. And so this is the start of today's webinar series. We've got some exciting stories to tell you. And uh, so we'd like to start, Carl, if we can go to the next slide, Marcel. Thank you. So essentially, we're going to start off with an overview of payment systems for the G2P or P2G digitization. And we're talking to Nilima Ramteke from the World Bank. This will be followed by a presentation by Cara and Costa from SASA, who will be talking about the 350 grant. Uh, we then listen to Bishnen Kumala from BankServe Africa, who's actually working on the rapid payments protocol and how we look at proxy payments, which is a very exciting development. Uh, we're then going to listen to Clinton Hyman from um, Dalrod around the payment voucher for agricultural grant to small scale farmers. And then we're going to listen to Intercub Shaikh from SARS on P2G payments. So with that, um, Nalima, can we start with your presentation and a brief overview? If you can just start with a quick introduction of yourself as well, and then you can actually start with your presentation. Thank you, Cathy. Uh, good morning, afternoon, everyone. I'm Nilima Ramtiki, Senior Financial Sector Specialist at the World Bank. Um, Nilima, are you on mute? No. We can hear her. You're not we able to hear me? We can hear as well. Okay, I can't hear. Hmm. 
Is it better now? Can you hear, Jeannie, can you hear Nalima? Uh, yes, I can. can hear. It's just on yes. my side. Okay. Let me try and sort myself out. My laptop ah, is muted. Oh, thanks, Marceline. <laughs> right. Can you hear me now? I'm able to hear you. I can hear you. Super duper. Thanks so much, Nelly. Maybe we can start. Thank you. I'm having yeah. a blonde moment, Nelly. <laughs> no, no issues at all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cathy, for the overview you just gave. And uh, good morning, afternoon, everyone. I'm Nelly Maramtiki, Senior Financial Sector Specialist for the World Bank, looking into payments, market, infrastructure area. Uh, prior to the World Bank, I was with the Reserve Bank and worked for more than two and a half decades in the payments and uh, market infrastructure area. So that's a brief background about me. Uh, so today's, session, uh, today's uh, presentation, I would be more focusing on the G2P payments and also government payments in general. And some case studies which, which uh, will tell about how initiatives have taken by various jurisdictions and how they have helped in uh, digitization of payments and the long-term perspective as well. So do those measures may be uh, confined, uh, started with the pandemic, but they may have a, a long-term perspective uh, impact as well. So as we all know, G2P and P2G payments are an important pillar of, for digitization of the economy. So that starts with the payments as well. And the countries are making efforts for digitizing the government payments. Uh, the recent pandemic uh, brought to fore the importance or the need uh, for the alternate made of payment, payment options instead of cash when social distancing was the norm to be practiced. So we have seen that jurisdiction leverage the digital payment modes and instruments for making social benefit transfers. And the, a number of authorities uh, and also the private sector took uh, measures to increase the usage uh, of digital payments and the availability of the payments infrastructure. Uh, the measures uh, uh, undertaken were some to validate the business continuity plans as well, which validated the business continuity plan and, and also ensuring uh, the availability of the uh, infrastructure in a non-disruptive uh, manner. Uh, it also triggered, you can say, the crisis management framework, and also some uh, uh, countries or jurisdictions have uh, adjusted or made adjustment to their crisis management uh, framework as well. Uh, the steps all taken were also ar around how best the available infrastructures and resources could be shared among all stakeholders. And many jurisdictions have uh, taken measures for increasing the adjusting the operating hours by rotation of the staff as well to see that the <coughs> needs of the various uh, users are met and the available infrastructure uh, and the payment options are available on a 24 by 7 basis or near real time payments as well. Uh, also, in order to encourage uh, the digital modes of payments, uh, authorities took uh, measures for enabling customers and uh, merchant onboarding by simplifying the KYC requirements, as well as leveraging the eKYC and uh, remote onboarding of the customers. Uh, also, a lot of measures were taken towards uh, uh, encouraging people for using the digital modes by way of uh, waiving of uh, the customer related charges and as well. Uh, also increasing the transaction limits where there were certain limits put on uh, the threshold up to which a transaction could be initiated on a, a non-person basis, uh, non-person, uh, 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 remote basis, I should say. So next slide, please. Uh, this is a graphic repre representation of the surge in transactions during the initial six months period uh, of COVID-19. Uh, these are just a sample uh, countries which we have taken, India, Mexico, Turkey, and Pakistan, which uh, for showing the increasing trend uh, on the digital mode of payment. Uh, the usage of uh, digital payment during pandemic was possible because of the prior actions taken and the infrastructure available <coughs> for making payment. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, next slide, please. The pandemic has uh, also shown that countries that decided to use the digital payments achieved a more efficient del delivery of the social benefit protection payments. However, a long-term gain from these uh, processes can only be achieved 
if there is a well-functioning and efficient payment ecosystem in place. So we will see a few country examples that efficiently leveraged uh, uh, on the digital payments and uh, also is sustainability. Uh, so next slide, please. So though we are looking at uh, the measures taken during pandemic, uh, the impact of the actions of jurisdiction is present from a long-term perspective. So we, we all know that Brazil has been uh, has taken a number of actions initially as well, wherein they have uh, active uh, protection program, uh, active social protection programs for like the Bolsa Familia, uh, and this uh, this is uh, targeting specific households and payments are made digitally. Uh, the emergency social protection payments during COVID-19 was uh, launched uh, using the similar process and using the railroad already laid down for the regular uh, social protection payments. Uh, uh, the, the program, the, uh, the uh, emergency payment program was launched sometime in April, June 2020 and around uh, close to 68 uh, million beneficiaries received, it, uh, received the emergency aid uh, till February 21. Uh, and a total of uh, 536 million were dispersed to these beneficiaries. Uh, for, doing, uh, uh, for doing so, a separate app was launched by Kaixa Bank, which is basically the initial bank, uh, the bank which uh, uh, is uh, enrolled by the government for making all social protection payments. So uh, the, the, uh, and this helped in the registration and opening of accounts. Uh, which are the social savings account. These are basically basic accounts with limited operational flexibility, and it has limits on transactions that can be performed. Uh, the, the, uh, the digital social savings account uh, do have certain features as well, like they allow for two free ATM transactions per month, three monthly transfers to other bank accounts, unlimited transfer within Kaixa bank uh, accounts, and uh, two monthly statements as well. So these are certain uh, functions, facilities provided to basic accounts as well. Uh, however, the program has since been extended up to October 2021, that's this month. Uh, these uh, leveraging the digital payments has been possible because uh, Brazil already had a well-established uh, ecosystem and uh, which has a vibrant uh, payment market. And you will see a lot of uh, merchants accepting small ticket size transactions as well on the road sides. So this is where Brazil has an edge over the other countries as well. Uh, the central bank has also implemented an uh, interoperable fast payment infrastructure, PIS, PIX, it's called, uh, in November, 2020. Uh, the system includes uh, key overlay services, including the account validation, alias, and QR payments. Uh, it also allows for non-banks PSPs participation as well. Uh, and up till uh, December 2020, uh, the past payment has registered more than 134 million accounts, of which uh, around 27 million were registered by Kaixa Bank for, as part of the uh, <coughs> social uh, uh, program uh, uh, users. So we'll go to the next slide. Oh, Jordan, you are already there. So the emergency social program by Jordan uh, was started in March 2020. Uh, the government had appointed the National Aid Fund, that is the NF, NF, NAF, uh, which also actually does the regular social payments as well. Uh, apart from that, uh, Social Security Corporation was set up for the emergency payment for COVID-19. And uh, this is basically to aid the, the vulnerable households from the economic turmoil caused uh, due to COVID-19. Uh, the funds were transferred to recipients uh, on the mobile bank, uh, mobile wallets or bank accounts. Uh, before the uh, pandemic as well, the NFS was already transitioning uh, to its aid distribution mechanisms uh, from physical distribution to the postal uh, post office to disbursement to the bank account. So this some certain initiatives were already on the uh, radar of uh, the central bank. And more than uh, during this uh, pandemic for the social benefit transfer, we see that more than uh, 250,000 beneficiaries received aid uh, uh, from NA through mobile wallets and more than 12,000 beneficiaries received aid from SSS through mobile wallets as well. However, we see that uh, once the emergency economic support uh, was phased out, the transaction has decelerated. 
though that though we see that there has been a positive impact since uh, the covid and people are still using uh, uh, the mobile money and uh, there are there is a uh, year and year increase over the transaction has been observed for other payments as well uh, however this uh, has brought to light some of the issues that need to be addressed and these include uh, the uh, legal certainty to digital payments on lines of check which is there in jordan uh, also we uh, we found that there is a concentration of merchants uh, uh, with only a few acquire entities uh, doing the merchant acquiring the acceptance of uh, digital payments uh, is found to be expensive uh, while uh, interoperability is enabled for non bank psps a cost to send funds between e wallet uh, provider is quite high and uh, non banks are really struggling towards that uh, for uh, profitability also the agent network uh, is underdeveloped and uh, uh, we see that the banks are facing regulatory challenges uh, for deploying their own uh, agents as well the positive uh, aspect is that the payments infrastructure is in the process of modernizing with uh, jopec is uh, underway to implement the fast payment uh, system that is click uh, next slide please yeah uh, gotamela we see that the emergency uh, program uh, covered almost uh, 2.6 uh, million families uh, the, this program was launched by the government in coordination with the electricity suppliers banks and the payment infrastructure operators pipe b and uh, visanet uh, which uh, which implemented the delivery of uh, digital payments and i think this was done very efficiently uh, the payment was based uh, basically on uh, unicode uh, sent through sms to beneficiaries uh, that could be used for purchases uh, purchases at uh, merchants uh, equipped with uh, post terminals and uh, and for withdrawal of cash at atms operated by 5p and the branches of uh, banks participating in the system the program was uh, successful as the, sto the stakeholders uh, that control the key infrastructure were also involved however we see no real benefit uh, out of this program from the long term perspective as uh, the 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 mechanism or this payment uh, option has not been leveraged for actually facilitating opening of transaction accounts for the beneficiaries the modernization of uh, payment infrastructure is is underway uh, like observed in jordan even in uh, gotamala we see that the merchant acquiring is concentrated uh, with a few entities and the cost of uh, acceptance of digital payments is quite high the network is also agent network is also controlled by a few entities uh, for end users also it is observed that the cost is very high so we go to the next slide please and we will see that uh, how the countries uh, which have decided to use digital payments uh, delivered the social uh, protection payments efficiently however from the long term gains are observed or achieved if there is a well functioning and efficient payment ecosystem uh, in place like we see the brazil case from the three country examples we saw the countries have efficiently definitely efficiently leveraged on the digital channels for payment uh, though their digital payments ecosystem is at a different level uh, brazil is uh, ahead of jordan on guatemala uh, with a faster payment system already implemented and offering a uh different use cases uh with brazil also the action taken earlier itself uh, against the anti corruption by having anti corruption practices uh, 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 regulations around that has helped in uh, the acquiring market infrastructure development as well uh the opening of social savings account is as we all know is key uh and and to realize the gains uh, the the infrastructure or the mechanism adopted should leverage on that for opening of the transactions account and the cash transfer which was missing in the case of gotamela this allows uh, because opening of account allows for the long, low income users to uh, have access to an account as well as uh, to a payment instrument next slide please uh, so we, the the g2 payment architecture therefore is very critical and uh, should be designed in a holistic manner the architecture should be such that uh, multiple programs can be plugged in into a shared infrastructure 
and the shared infrastructure should be interoperable and uh, support uh, various programs and service providers. Uh, this includes definitely the treasury account, the interoperable payment systems, the ID and the uh, alias systems as well. Uh, the, uh, the other is about the G2P architecture should also provide options to choose the uh, financial service providers and the access points as well. Should the, the, whether it is to be used at the ATMs or the agents, whichever, or the bank branch. So people should be able to use any of these channels and infrastructure, even if they are getting their benefits uh, through any mechanism. So multiple G2P flows, uh, if the, you are, uh, are viewed in a holistic and a, 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 a shared infrastructure basis, it definitely provides economies of scale and which are visible and brings more uh, actors and funds to the table to push for any changes that uh, then action taken in silos, that is programs digitized one by one, because then that uh, the, uh, different mechanisms adopted, it's a long-term perspective as well. And it takes time and also cost as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we uh, we are just take presenting the India case because we will try to see how just oppose it with whatever we just spoke about, so that will help us in understanding the uh, the mechanisms adopted and how it, uh, it has helped uh, from the long term perspective. So in India, there is a Bank of India, the central bank, uh, uh, who is the central bank and also banker to the government, uh, took the initiative of digitizing the government payments, starting with salary uh, payments and the agenda for inclusion of uh, other type of government payments in intensified over a period of time when simultaneously also the government had taken measures for digitizing its own infrastructure as well at its end, both at the central government as well as state government levels. Uh, the the e-Kuber, which you see over here, is basically the core banking system of the RBI. It facilitates government payments, both the receipts and uh, payment, uh, using the NEFT, which is the payment system operated by the Reserve Bank of India itself, uh, which is the retail payment system. And the, the payments cover, uh, basically for the government, it covers this, uh, the salary payments, vendor payments, social benefit transfers as well. And the receipt rece covers both the tax and non-tax payments as well. So both these are facilitated through the uh, infrastructure put in place by the government and the RBI as, as well. Uh, the, the PFMS, which is the public financial management system, is a web-based uh, online software application developed uh, and implemented by the Controller General of Accounts. Uh, the primary objective of the PFMS is to facilitate uh, the sound financial management system for the government uh, by establishing efficient uh, uh, funds flow as well as a payment farm accounting network. Uh, the PFMS also provides various stakeholders with the real-time, reliable, and meaningful management of information, uh, which helps in effective decision support as part of the Digital India Initiative of the Government of India. Uh, at present, the PFMS uh, 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 interfaces with the core banking system of the banks, also the RBI, which is the central bank, and the India Post and Cooperative Banks. Uh, so we'll go to the next slide, please. Oh, yeah, you're already there, sorry. Uh, with, the, with the development of uh, the other infrastructure referred to as uh, India Stack, that is basically Aadhaar, the national ID system, uh, and the, the DigiLock, uh, which is which helps in uh, uh, safe custody of the documents in a digital format, uh, and also the payment layer, which include which which actually provide uh, access through API. All these uh, India Stack, with what we are talking about are API-based access, provide API-based access, and that is why it is more easy to interlink the system as well. And interoperability is established by connecting these systems uh, uh, seamlessly. Uh, so th this, this infrastructure has been leveraged and the other has helped in targeting the beneficiaries uh, for opening of accounts and using the other as the unique identifier for the benefit transfers as well. The social benefits uh, have been directly channeled to the bank accounts. Uh, all benefit transfers currently are being channeled and are paid to the bank accounts uh, 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 using the uh, either the NEFT system or the NACH system operated by the NPCI or the other uh, uh, payment bridge, which, which is again uh, the uh, the transactions get settled as part of the NACH system itself, which is the bulk payment system. Uh, the benefits can be received can be withdrawn by the beneficiaries at ATMs, micro ATMs, or at withdrawal at the bank counters as well. Uh, recently, also the government has uh, leveraging the infrastructure put in by NPCA on the UPI side. Uh, the e-rupee e has been launched, which is a one-time payment mechanism. Uh, 
uh, and has been launched by the government, uh, uh, the NPCI in association with the government, that is the Digital Financial Services, which is a department of the government of Ministry of Finance, uh, the National Health Authority, and the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. So this benefit would be for the targeted purposes. And now they started with the health side, but it can be for any purpose as well. So it would be a targeted purpose and for the, and the, uh, the benefits can be utilized at the outlet, which will facilitate for the purpose only. So these are certain things which are there. So we go to the next slide, please. So overall, we, we see that uh, the end-to-end -end GTP payments has to be looked at it from a holistic perspective and the infrastructure should be leveraged such that uh, uh, the end-to-end -end payment should, uh, uh, the, the infrastructure should be uh, used in such a way that it leverages the modern payments infrastructure as well as the digital infrastructure put in place by uh, the other authorities, uh, which like the national ID and all. So which allows for uh, bulk payments to all type of account. Uh, the payment system infrastructure should be such that it allows bulk, the, uh, the government G2P payment should be such that uh, it should have the option for using any type of payment and the end user should also have a choice to uh, which account or the which mode it wants to uh, receive the fund. So these are certain things which needs to be enabled. So the, the infrastructure uh, uh, identified for the purpose should allow for bulk payments to all type of uh, accounts, uh, provide for ability to validate whether the beneficiary is indeed the owner of the account like we have the, in, indicated on the other side. Uh, the proxy and allies, which is basically uh, to use for standardizing the disbursement process, and it also provides convenience to the recipients. And uh, also because of the fast payment uh, implemented uh, globally, is being implemented globally in many jurisdictions are taking steps towards that. Uh, these will help many use cases around that as well, uh, and also enable uh, instant payments. The, uh, the, the, mechan the, the options, uh, uh, adopted or utilized should allow for reconciliation and provide for information to the benef beneficiaries uh, of its transaction as well. Uh, the recipients uh, should be able to use the account for various use cases. I just mentioned about that. And uh, with the, the, the different level of interoperability, like from transferring from a bank account to wallet, wallet to a bank account, or uh, our wallet to wallet as well. Uh, and it also should uh, facilitate or uh, provide access to other services like the bill payments, financial services as well. Uh, moreover, the infrastructure should uh, provide for the merchant acceptance of merchant of digital payments and uh, used by the recipients in case of uh, the, uh, by way of enhancing the accept acceptance infrastructure and encouraging the merchants to accept digital payments. Uh, the, the, the access to the end user should be convenient, like we see in the Jordan case where the beneficiaries use the SMS uh, to withdraw money as well. Uh, the pricing should be such that it should not exclude uh, the beneficiaries from using continued usage of the digital uh, mode of payment. So this is these are certain uh, contours which should be taken into account while designing the GTP payment uh, architecture and the infrastructure in any country. So I pause over here and thank you. I think I shot up by a few minutes. I'm sorry for that. No, that's not a problem. Thank you so much, Nalima. That was really fascinating. And nice to see the Brazil and uh, Jordan and India cases again. Um, we do have some questions. So if you can have a look, there's a question from Chris Hamilton, which you need to prepare. Um, I'm going to hand over to Karen Costa from SASA to actually present uh, on the SRD 350 grant and the approach uh, of an end-to-end -end, uh, digital payment system. Um, Karen's actually been a manager at SASA since my days when I was there in the early 2000s. So she's almost like a founding member at SASA. And um, um, Karen, over to you. I understand you'll be flatting your own slides. Yes, thank you, Kathy. Um, can I just request whether it's um, visible on your side? It's visible, but it's not in presentation mode, Karen. There we go. Perfect, thank you so much, excellent. Thank you. So I'm just quickly gonna take you through some interesting facts around this grant um, and the system itself, uh, a little bit from the archive, hi highlights on how the grant works and then um, improved grant from one August and then our, a little bit around our latest statistics. So um, a rapid assessment study that was undertaken for the Department of Social Development contains some interesting facts. 
uh, food is by far the one single item that is used um, uh, by the recipients of this grant. 70% of those who applied for the grant lives in households of more than four people. 95.84% owns a cell phone, and you will realize later on why this becomes very important. Um, the process to apply, um, the recipients um, found 88.68% found that it's actually very easy and straightforward to apply for the grant. Um, there's ample evidence uh, for the need of a government-wide integrated social security registry. And then the use of online digital platforms um, has prepared the ground for the advent of digital welfare in South Africa. Now, if we look a little bit back um, at where we started at, um, the new COVID grant um, required a unique approach um, as put the potential applicants uh, were not found on any of our existing databases. Um, unfortunately, due to the implementation of top-up grants um, at the same time in the SOCPIN environment, um, we were unable to also develop and manage the implementation of the COVID-19 grant. And we had to look at a new system um, that, we, that we can use for this. So we then started by developing a whole new system, um, utilizing our existing uh, SASA biometric environment. And then obviously all the access to this um, system is then also uh, through biometric verification. And then um, the solution is highly scalable as we can see with the amount of increasing numbers of clients that we, we have. Uh, the timeline around the system and system development, um, as we all know, the president announced a nationwide lockdown and it started on the 26th of, of March, 2020. Um, on 21 April, president announced the new SRD 350 grant. Uh, 30 April, the Minister of Social Development announced measures to implement the interventions. And then on 9 May, um, the directions were issued. She then opened on 11 May the, the grant um, and launched it and the application started streaming in. And we are very proud to say that on the 15th of May, SASA paid its first clients for the SRD grant in a newly developed and fully online electronic system. A little bit of background as to how the grant works. Um, the grant was initially approved for six months um, it was then extended on the 15th of, of October to continue from 1 November till 31 January. It was extended on the 11th of February to continue from 1 February to 30 April. Um, they were in three months um, that the grant was not active and then the grant was reintroduced on the 1st of August and it will run until the 31st of March 2020. Uh, 2022, sorry. Um, just a little bit of the criteria that we are using when we are looking at um, um, the consideration for clients and which clients actually qualify for this grant. Um, so, the, I'm, and I'm not going to necessarily go through all of this. Um, it's very important when we look at the databases that we are using to actually verify all of this information. So we have uh, South African citizens, permanent residents and refugees on the Home Affairs database. We've later on also introduced asylum seekers and permit holders. Um, you must be resident within the borders of South Africa. Um, you must be above the age of 18 and unemployed. Not receiving an income was the initial requirement. And currently we are saying um, not receiving an income above 595 rand. Also not receiving a, any social grant. Um, we have subsequently included the um, caregivers uh, specifically from the social grant environment. Uh, not receiving any unemployment insurance benefit or qualified to receive it, that's the UIF, and then not receiving a stipend from the National Student Financial Aid Scheme or NSFAS as we refer to it, and they should not be resident in a government funded or subsidized institution, like for instance, correctional services. Um, very important, when our clients apply, they sign a declaration and consent form, which provides us with consent to test on a number of um, uh, databases, as well as to make use of the banks to verify the income of the clients in the environment. I'm just going to take you through how the system works at a very high level. Um, we have all of the application channels, different application channels that's coming in. Uh, we consolidate all of those. It goes to a COVID system interface where we do deduplication so that we ensure that we have only one ID or one application per client. Um, from there, it goes to a COVID qualifier database where we actually then look at who in, in this environment qualifies. 
it's very important that we need to note that each client is reconsidered every single month because the circumstances of the client could have changed. So a client could be recently employed or might have been released from prison, uh, received a grant, et cetera. So through this verification mechanism, we then have an outcome for each client every single month, which is either declined or approved. And it could happen that in one month you are approved and in the next month you might be declined. Um, we have also built an extensive risk management framework specifically to this grant for instances where there are suspected irregularities um, and uh, where we then put the client in a referred status for our fraud um, uh, unit to, to investigate. Um, I just want to quickly outline, so our qualifier database works like this. We exclude people under the age of 18, and we exclude people above the age of 60, as both of these categories can actually apply for a social grant and qualify there. We want to exclude people in the informal industry, and the, in, the unemployment is basically our baseline that we are looking at um, for payments. Then active grant recipients, we are excluding correctional services, government institutions, um, those type of grants like NSFAS, road accident funds, and others, the um, unemployment um, benefits, uh, COVID-19, other social assistance, and I think we will hear from um, Dalrat later on this afternoon. Um, also, partial, partial, municipalities, agencies, government employment pension fund, and then finally, um, we look to SARS in terms of pay as you earn, the retail, entertainment, engineering, all of those categories we basically wanted to exclude. Now, that was the dream. Um, if we can quickly look at what we have achieved, um, active grant ben um, recipients we are excluding. We are excluding um, people in correctional services, um, government institutions um, like DSD, COIDA, RAV, and others we are not currently um, interfacing with um, due to various challenges that we are experiencing there, but we are interfacing with NSFAS as well as with the um, um, UIF. And then also um, previously we, we had um, um, interfaces with the farmers, sportsmen, et cetera. Uh, we are also interfacing with partial, partial and government employee pension fund, however, not currently with the municipalities and the agencies. And then we are also interfacing with SARS specifically for um, looking at the IRP5 um, uh, database for our clients. So just to take you further on the journey, um, when we then consider these clients with all of the, the aforementioned information and databases at, at hand, we basically look at whether a client qualifies or not. If a client does not qualify, we send a cli the client an SMS to indicate that you do not qualify. We provide them with a reason why they don't qualify. And then we also provide them um, with uh, op op opportunity to actually apply for um, um, uh, reconsideration. Now, when we do the reconsideration, um, it's a validate, um, this validation we do specifically with the banks. Um, we, we refer to it as a means test. Uh, we, we have um, set up through a lot of interaction with the banks and um, agreements. We've set up that we are able to send them the ID numbers, names and surnames of our clients. And they then look at the bank account and indicate to us whether they actually have a bank account for the client. Um, then if they have a bank account, they would look like in the previous um, segment, whether a client then has any income flowing into that bank account, which will then preclude them from, from applying for the grant or qualifying for the grant. Um, we also look at the risk flags and we're also doing um, that with, with the um, uh, banks. Specifically, we are currently making use of the South African Fraud Prevention Service, TransUnion and Experience Services in this environment. If a client then still do not qualify, we will send them uh, SMS to say that you still do not qualify for the grant. So we have found you on a database. And when we look at your bank details, you actually had a flow of income. In the cases where um, we right from the start say a client um, qualifies for, for the grant, we will look towards the, the banking details of the client and the client will either be a bank client or an unbanked client. If the client is banked, uh, we will do a nat uh, through National Treasury an account verification with the banks uh, to determine if all of that information is correct um, and we all will be able to pay the client. If the client is unbanked and, for instance, uh, prefer to have a cell phone validation, um, we will look at uh, that and then uh, all of these details we are then writing to um, outcome database in our environment um, that contains the client details, 
the outcome specifically of the client, the banking details of the client, and then also the cell phone number of the client. In cases where the client either fails the account verification process or the through our risk scoring, um, the fail the cell phone validation, or where the client has not made a choice or provided us with bank details, um, we also write that information to the outcome database. Um, then in terms of our daily extractions that we do, it basically follows these three processes that we have there. For the banked clients, uh, we send a through a file transmission process to BankServe, um, the um, payment file that goes to the banks and the client can then collect his money from the banks. Um, and the, this is all underlined with a reconciliation process that we are following with, with the banks. If the client is unbanked, um, it follows a process where we look at um, through the South African Fraud Prevention Service, TransUnion Experian um, and others um, at the client status. If we are able to um, um, ensure that the cell phone number actually belongs to that client and there are no other risk scores that we should consider, we through a file transmission process through BankServe, then send um, cash sent um, uh, file to the banks and the banks will then ensure that the client receives the money through a cash sent voucher. Once again, there's a full reconciliation process that we undertake. In the event where there are challenges with a client, like we've indicated there's a, a failed account verification or the client did not make a choice or provide us with bank, bank details, we will create a, an account for the client with PostBank. Once again, once the, the account is created, we will make the, the payment to the client through a file transmission process through BankServe to um, PostBank. And we are then making use of um, uh, SAPU where we will send the client the SMS to indicate when he or she will be able to go and collect their grant. This process once again is reconciled um, back to SASA in terms of all the payments. Now, this whole system, um, as I've indicated, was developed in a very, very short period. Um, we have ensured that it's underlined with security, auditability, access management, and as I've indicated, that is a biometric access at the moment. Um, also, we're looking after disaster recovery, analytics and dashboards for all of those elements that is underwriting this environment. So maybe just a quick um, overview of the challenges that we are receiving um, with, with regards to the databases. And I think this is very important um, for how we take our um, uh, payment systems forward in South Africa. Uh, social grants, we don't really have a problem. However, we do find that there are quite a number of our grant recipients that also apply for this grant. Um, they are then excluded except for the um, um, caregivers in, in this environment. Correctional services, the database is quite straightforward. There might be a little bit of timing issues in terms of when we look at um, the database from um, uh, correctional services and when some of the inmates are actually released. Um, but otherwise, there, there are not that many um, challenges that we're having with this, with this database. Um, the partial and partial database, we have um, not many, in, um, um, uh, not that many inquiries um, initially from the partial and partial, uh, but we had some timing issues um, with regards to when we received it, the files, um, and we have now moved to receiving monthly files instead of just receiving quarterly files. Um, National Student Financial Aid Scheme, uh, the database seemed to have some inclusions as well as exclusion errors and um, is problem problematic. Um, to us in terms of, of this grant, and we are then making use for um, in terms of the reconsideration process with the banks doing the means testing. The UIF, we originally had some challenges with um, UIF. Uh, we've received rece um, refreshed databases, and we have continuous interaction at the moment with UIF, um, ensuring that um, we improve on how we understand their data and how um, we then decline or approve clients in this regard. National Population Register, challenges with how um, the applicants supply the information. So somebody might be, um, let's say, Katerina Elizabeth Koster, but they apply as Karen Koster, um, which is then problematic for us. Uh, we have indicated to clients that they should apply exactly as it is on the, um, um, uh, on the um, identity document, but we still find that clients don't always consider that. Um, the IRP5, SARS, um, we are looking at the IRP5, but for us in this um, environment at the moment, it is also problematic as the file is um, 
um, not current. So somebody, um, like I've indicated there, March 2020 till February 2021, somebody could have lost their job in, let's say, May or June last year, and will still then be reflected um, on the IRP5 as an IRP5 client. Once again, there we are looking really at the, the means testing for the clients. Um, means testing with the banks, we don't have any challenges in that environment. Um, the process is quite straightforward and the banks are extremely helpful um, in, in, in the way that we are um, applying the, the means testing. Other databases we've previously consulted are arts and culture, sports, farmers, spaza shops. Um, so these are just because they were all special COVID grants and we considered them, um, most of them we are not considering at the moment. We've received various audit findings from the AGSA. Um, for differing databases um, that we are using. So AGSA does not necessarily use the same database that we are using, uh, which then provides us with these exclusions and inclusions. And then also the timing issues in terms of when we receive the databases, AGSA obviously receive it much later and they, they have um, what we can call a 50-50 or 100% hindsight view from it. And there we then have um, a number of the audit findings. We are in discussion with AGSA around this because there are also quite a number of audit findings that they have brought out that we don't agree with them and we were able to prove um, the, the disagreement then as well. If we then can I ask you to present quite quickly? Can I give you another two to three minutes, please? Yes, sure, Cathy. Um, I'm just going to then quickly go through this. Email and forms did not work for us, so we've subsequently um, um, uh, um, not use it anymore. The USSD um, is an extremely costly process. Uh, we are going to reintroduce it, but then um, uh, push the, the, the cost no, um, to the clients. WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, as well as our web, website is zero rated. Clients can uh, apply through that. We're also making use of the SASA bot and then the SASA mobile um, app is something that we want to introduce. I'm going to skip the new project milestones that we have. Just interesting facts, 12 million applications were received um, and verified within the first month this time around. Uh, we've received four times more applications on the first day in August this year as compared to May in 2020. Uh, more payments were also processed on the first day. We currently have 13.8 million applications that we are considering on a monthly basis, of which 8.4 million on average are approved and paid. And then we are making use of the latest databases. Uh, just some important aspects that we need to look at um, in terms of the future payment systems in South Africa, and this is my very last slide. Uh, we need to look at the number of clients that apply on one cell phone number. The challenge with this becomes when you want to send somebody a message to say you can go and collect your grant or you need to provide banking details or anything like that. It does not always reach the client. We have had up to 400 and more clients on one single number. The T's and C's like your declaration and consent is very, very important that you have that upfront, as well as banking details and other personal information as far as possible to get those upfront as well. Procurement turnaround times in government is sometimes problematic and we need to look at that. Um, it could impact on operations. Um, at the moment, we are unable to do reconsideration for our clients as the, um, um, our agreements with the banks are not in place yet. We only received feedback from National Treasury in this week to indicate that we can continue with the process with banks. Payments of clients through cash sent. There's a requirement from the Minister of Finance that we must absolutely match the client to the cell phone number. And we have challenges in accessing the mobile operator databases in this regard. And we need to use a number of other than risk mitigating factors, which could be problematic for, for other institutions as well. We definitely need to look at the um, centralizing of all our databases in government and see how we can work on that to achieve um, better efficiencies of scale for government as a whole. And then also communication with clients and other stakeholders are extremely key in these processes that we are following. Having an eye on social media where most of our clients um, seems to interact a lot. And then also looking at modern call center technology and aspects like chatbots in the call centers. Cathy, thank you very much. That's everything from my side. Thanks so much, Karen. And there are one or two questions for you, but just uh, excellent presentation and well done from Arinda, who's actually at the UIF. And Kate's also saying it's amazing what has been achieved in such a short space of time with so much process innovation. And I agree, it, um, it, SAS has been on a remarkable journey over the last 18 months, and I know it's been grueling. Um, so we're going to move to Bishnin Kumalo, 
who's actually at Bank Serve Africa, and she's going to be presenting on the um, payments, the rapid payments protocol. Bishnen, over to you. If you can give us a quick introduction as well, thank you. Hi, Kathy, and hello, everyone. My name is Bishnin Kumalo. I look after modernization at Banks of Africa, and I am focusing this today's presentation on um, the rapid payments program. If you'll just give me one second so that I can present it. Um, um, can everybody see it? Yes, we can. You may go ahead. Thank you. Okay, awesomeness. Um, so my presentation today is focusing mainly on the rapid payments program, but I thought um, I should give an oversight of what Banks of Africa is, what we do. Uh, for those of you who've been listening to uh, Karen's and various others um, overview, just to give a recap of what we are as a payment switch. So as you know, uh, or some, some of you will know, we are a clearing house. We have been clearing for the last 49 years and we do um, various clearing elements such as uh, EFT card, RTCs, some, some limited value added services uh, that we also provide. And we also then settle uh, via the South African Reserve Bank into the SAMOS capability. So we're the inter switch when uh, you listen to Karen giving an overview in terms of why they use bank service because we are sitting in a central spot where we're able to distribute funds into uh, the various bank accounts that, uh, for example, in Karen's overview, social grant beneficiaries have. Where we are is currently we're a payments and settlements capability and we provide switching capabilities that is bank to bank payments um, for the, in the domestic landscape um, currently. Where we're looking to grow is to provide access and services uh, that will enable us to connect payers to customers uh, via their cell phones, via um, uh, other uh, core capabilities such as till points, et cetera, in order to enable uh, the integration into our ecosystem, not just of bank to bank payments, but also facilitating payments across um, the value ecosystem. Um, as you know, currently channels go through or what we call channels in the banking space, that is either your uh, cell phone banking or your um, uh, internet banking and various other channels that your uh, end customers would use to interact with the payments ecosystem. This is the current ecosystem that uh, exists. What we're looking to do is to, we currently operate in the regulated space, but where we are growing into is into that is into that access point and channel sp uh, space that our end customers, our end consumers will start to be able to access the national payment system. How we're going to facilitate that is through secure APIs, and that's going to enable us to interact with various ecosystem players like the like banks, as well as non-banks into this ecosystem. As we grow other capabilities that we're working on, such as the digital identity program that will enable us to further enhance these capabilities that we as Banks of Africa provide currently. As we start to merge together this ecosystem, the other extensions such as QR code, uh, blockchain, secure identifiers, and various other technological advancements that we see, we see our growth as Banks of Africa in being able to provide a more holistic capability that will link all of these ecosystem players from banks to non-banks, to customers, from payers to recipients, underpinned by uh, um, newer technologies that enable us to access some of these um, innovations that we see in the digital ecosystem, but that will also facilitate and enable payments holistically overall. I think it's important when you see where Banks of Africa is, where we are going, when you're starting to look at uh, government payments and how government payments can be enabled and facilitated. We saw the examples, uh, I believe from Nilima earlier around how other ecosystems, other payment, uh, regional payment systems 
are looking to modernize and also provide that integration so that you, do, you not only have national clearing or national payments from salary payments um, to social grant beneficiaries, as Corinne was uh, providing an overview, having a capability that Banks of Africa has in order to be able to blend and merge these types of payments into an already existing ecosystem that we're in the process of modernizing, I think for uh, the uh, public sector and government um, listeners in the audience, you can see that Banks of Africa is uniquely positioned to be able to facilitate and enable some of these uh, flows. Um, this is where we are going as an institution. We are standardizing APIs. Uh, there's still controlled access for non-banks, of course, because of the regulation that the South African Reserve Bank uh, places upon deposit holders, uh, orchestration of banks and non-banks, and we are extending our banking services to other um, uh, ecosystem players like insurance and lending, and I think hopefully into the public sector as well in, uh, in order to to be able to facilitate those. And then there will be other additional services such as identity, enhanced risk management and analysis of data services, which we're looking to um, also provide. Let's then talk, this is Banks of Africa, this is who we are. As we then move on to the topic at hand is in terms of what is rapid payments and how is it enabling and facilitating us um, as a, not only as an institution, as a, as a mutual institution that we are providing our financial payments into, but also in terms of the end consumers that we're looking to reach in the previous slide. One of the things that we're looking to do is we're looking to deepen financial um, enablement via accessible, inclusive cashless payments option that is, that is available for all. The key thing for us is this notion of interoperability. We see a lot of uh, mobile or other custom built uh, capabilities, cash wallets, capabilities that are not only within the continent of Africa, but uh, a wider field as well. But what we are looking to drive is interoperability into the space, um, as well as contributing to safe, reliable, uh, and efficient national payment system that's going to ultimately benefit all of South Africa. Our foundational building block is SARB's vision 2025 in, in order to enhance competition, interoperability, as I've already mentioned, financial inclusion. The building blocks underneath that was the drive that we as a financial services sector put forward uh, with our partners, uh, the Payment Association of South Africa, Banks of Africa, the Banking Association Council as well, in order to provide a future and modernized payments ecosystem for, 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 the, for the South African uh, economy. This would require a unified uh, payments platform architecture, overlay services, uh, bulk instant payments as well, and then future-proofing our capabilities in order to be able to, to do high value payments as well as cross-border. That's where the rapid payments uh, platform started to emerge and the definition there too in order to provide clearing, instant clearing, uh, proxy service, which I'll explain in a minute, uh, and as well as a request to payment service. It has to be underpinned, obviously, by robust control risk framework that protects the, the deposits and the monies of uh, consumers in this space, as well as ensuring that our service level agreements are, are actively managed in order to ensure that we have a robust, safe, uh, always on capability that we're providing for this ecosystem, but that also looks at uh, eating away at cash. Again, underpinned by API application programming interfaces, rich messaging that's also backed up by ISO 20022. Um, how does rate rapid payments work? It is looking at these core segments of um, uh, types of South Africans. We wanted to access uh, for the underbanked, uh, those that perhaps potentially like the social grant recipients receive money in electronic form, but then go quickly on to withdraw it, draw it down completely, and then use cash for the remainder of the month until they can get their payments again. The banked, those that are banked, but um, there is, 
uh, the ease of payments, the instantness of payments, the ability for one person to transact with another instantly and receive notification that their money is already being received. Um, that is also going to facilitate uh, the, 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 the use of uh, uh, accounts in the financial services ecosystem. Small merchants as well, small, small merchants, um, uh, they struggle with uh, income as well as having to pay for uh, acquiring uh, devices, POS machines, et cetera, in order to receive cash, or they have to live with a, a receipt of cash. And we believe that rapid payments can be um, a capability that can be used by all these different segments. Corporates as well, as we're moving into the corporate space, as we mentioned in the previous slide, the ability to do batch payments and looking at those capabilities is something that we as a program team are also working uh, towards defining. It's very simple to give you an overview of how the system uh, operates. Um, a person has to have an underlying um, uh, store of value. They have to have a, a bank account. So if you think of the, uh, the underbanked, they already have some sort of account that they receive. And if those participants, and we're getting more and more participants joining the rapid payments program, they will have a store of value. They'll just um, uh, create a proxy. And a proxy, think of it as a, as a name that can be associated with your standard transactional account. So your bank account now can be replaced with uh, Bishnin K at BSA, right? And that can be my proxy. And once I have that proxy, that's a memorable name or a mobile number, uh, my 072123. And I can use that as my proxy. There's obviously the mechanics that me as an institution provide in the background in terms of identifying who the proxy belongs to and how that links to that person's store of value to their transactional banking account that's held at a financial institution. But once those mechanisms are set up, it literally has that you think of a social grant recipient, they receive their money into an account that is enabled for rapid payments. They can walk up to the next person who has the same account and they can facilitate a payment just by choosing a receiver, initiating a payment, and then getting confirmation of that payment. And sub 10 seconds, the money has been moved from payer to beneficiary. And as one would say, Bob's your uncle. So, um, it has these three product features. We have proxy, we have a feature called request to pay. When I, when I explain what request to pay is to other uh, non-bankers, I say, think of it as a please call me. Um, proxy is a, is, a, is a push payment. So I want to pay, as in the previous example, Ms., I think it's Ms. Kutuan, uh, Mr. Kutuan and Ms. Sibia want to exchange value. One wants to buy from a market stall, et cetera. And the request to pay is the opposite of that. I want to get money from Kathy who owes me 500 rands. I send her a request to pay. She receives notification of that request. And if she wants to approve it, she approves it. And the money gets sent from Kathy's account to my account and it, and it is instant. And as mentioned, same building blocks, active SLA management, robust financial crime and risk management capability to prevent fraud. We talk of fraud and risk as a critical component of the rapid payments program because what we're looking to endear into the South African ecosystem is trust. Once your money is there, it will move from payer to beneficiary as you've uh, authorized it and it is safe and it is within the robust controls that we know that our financial services sector has already invested in, and we're looking to extend and to, and, and to utilize those, as well as the fact that it's API enabled and it's the ISO 20022, and uh, it's underpinned by an accessible, interoperable national payment system. So, um, Kathy, you'll tell me if I'm running late on time. In terms of a global overview, we've had uh, Nilima uh, giving us an overview, and in the previous sessions, in the in the in in, in this series of um, workshops and conferences, you've already heard from the different governments at uh, the different regions in terms of how uh, a faster payments capability has been enabled in those uh, in those regions. In the Philippines, the e-government pay in Thailand, we hear a lot about prompt pay, as well as the direct benefit transfer that you find in India. All of these have different capabilities and different 
public sector pushes. The, 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 the one consistency that we see ourselves as banks of Africa is the more we, a, a faster payments capability because it is generally uh, for, um, you know, to disperse, uh, to, sorry, to displace uh, cash, the more backing and support that it receives from the public uh, sector, from the governments, um, the more the utilization they will be and the greater the benefit it will create for um, the economy itself. And so for us, partnering, working with the public sector, whether it's small merchants, whether it's with uh, uh, the SASA uh, grant payments or any other component of the government payment system, we have seen from the other regional examples how public sector endorsement and utilization can facilitate and enable uh, capabilities such as this. How are we looking at it? We have also part and parcel of the studies that we're doing, looking at the South African informal economy. That is a, a big a topical area, which their view is there's been largely underinvested in, in terms of capability, payments uh, capability for these types of areas, despite the fact that these ecosystems, this informal economy, there are large amounts of uh, value in those ecosystems that will benefit not only um, the banking institutions and not only the SARB in terms of managing and maintaining the national payment system, but the economy as a whole, the more this um, these uh, amounts are regulated and managed, the easier it is for the public sector to, 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 to reach the benefits of, the, uh, of these movements of cash. We know about hole in the walls, plaza shops, informal food takeaways, licensed taverns and shibins, and also the muti market is just some of the examples that we picked to highlight. And we can see some of these, some of these studies were done over two, three years ago, and we're only seeing, we're working with uh, uh, Castinomics editor, Gigi Alcock, and we're seeing not only, oh, oh, during the COVID and the pandemic area, but we're seeing growth in these ecosystems as well as the use and starting to use uh, digital uh, capabilities to either do food deliveries or to manage uh, payments. So as these economies become more and more digitized, the more capabilities such as rapid payment system will start to also yield benefits. You can start Shnane, to you've got, about, Shnane, you've got about two minutes if that's okay to wrap up. Let me see what I want to focus my mind on. Um, we've already spoken about the SASA payment flow. So I guess then I'll stop there this, at, the, at this uh, slide, uh, Kathy, given the two minutes. There's different payment types that RPP can support. And from grant disbursements to unemployment benefits, from people paying government for water sanitation service, any services that the public sector provides to its citizens, electricity, as well as a back and forth between tax collections and refunds, and then transport and transport and, and traffic fines. So for us, rapid payments is but a capability that enables easy disbursements of funds between individuals and can be extended from government to persons to persons back to government. And we are on the journey of the program looking to go live next year and look forward to engaging with any of the um, public sector representatives on the call today in terms of how rapid payments can facilitate and enable any type of payment flows that you may be looking at. And as we mentioned, this is with great partnership with the NPSD at the SARB. And so we're doing this in tandem and working with the government already in order to ensure that we're not just building a capability for financial institutions or building a capability for the country as a whole. Thank you so much, Kathy. And with that, I can close. Thanks, Krishna. I'm gonna hand over to Clinton. Um, Clinton is actually from Dalrad and he's going to be presenting on the uh, small scale farmers grant. Clinton, if you can just give us a brief introduction of yourself. Um, I understand that we're flattening your slides, is that correct? You're on mute, Clinton. Good afternoon, everyone. Great. Yes, um, you're Thank welcome you. to slide my slides if you've got them. Um, otherwise, I can Super. do that. Marcel is going to put them up. Great. Thank you. Um, just background I'm from the Department of Agriculture. 
and reform and rural development. I've uh, been with the department for a number of years, um, since 2009, spent most of my time in the infrastructure unit, building roads and bridges and schools and houses. And as of last year, I am the national coordinator, um, provincial coordinator, chief director. Um, in September last year, I was asked to be the national coordinator for the PESI program, which was then to support smallholders, small scale farmers, actually subsistence producers. Where is that presentation? Oh, that's fine. I don't need that. I'm going to put off this video as so the green light disturbs me. Um, all right. So can I then start the presentation? Please go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, I've got somebody's block all over my screen. I can't see anything. Um, okay. You know, this is, I don't know. I don't know. This, I see nothing on my side at the moment. So. No, it's actually yeah. dropped off. Um, Karen, I mean, sorry, um, Carla, Marcel. Okay, there we go. Yeah, if right. you can just move to the next slide, I think after that, because this is just an outline. Yeah. Okay, so what, what we targeted here was we sub targeted subsistence producers. And much like um, social development did, we, we obviously excluded a whole lot of, there were exclusions. We wanted people to have an ID document. They had to be 18 years of age. They had to be involved in agricultural production. Um, we wanted to target women, youth, and people with disabilities. We we're going to focus on the, uh, the rural and the peri-urban areas, backyard gardens, balconies, communal land, common schools, etc. We would look at child-headed households, farm dwellers, and workers. Um, we were going to support military veterans. We were going to look at some narrow sec youth that we had um, recruited through the Kaoleza district coordination model. Um, we were going to also focus on any subsistence producer that hadn't received a grant in the current financial in that financial year. We weren't going to work with government or salaried, salaried employees, and the grants were going to range between a thousand and nine thousand rand. The grant, the grant was not a financial grant, but it was a grant for input supplies, um, and then we would also only be doing one award per household. Okay, next slide. Thank you. So we then did, and and I also saw that we went with a USSD application. Um, we didn't have much time to do this, so we, we put all of this together, you know, between September and December. We we worked with uh, uh, RT15 contract. We used Vodacom as our service provider, and I'll I'll just speak on that a bit later when we wrap up. Um, but we we were in a ten day period, um, and and why we did this with the USSD is the department went out on a national COVID uh, support program through our uh, trading account. And what they tried to do there was to help 50,000 smallholder farmers um, with uh, input supplies. But that, that process um, was a paper-based process. It was just at the start of, of the um, COVID pandemic. And they went out and they, it was locked down top level. Uh, we went out to the people in the field. We, they had to submit paper-based copies. So you can imagine all the, the administrative um, issues. Uh, police stations were closed. People couldn't get affidavits. They couldn't get proof of access to land. They couldn't get provide proof of uh, photos of production. So a, a number of things hampered that process. And we had many, many audit. The, the Auditor General then basically highlighted a number of findings on the process. And what we then took is we took the audit report and we, we then tried to mitigate that and we developed this process that, that I'm going to unpack now. So we, we did the USSD applications. In 10 days, we, re, we received 178,000 applications. Um, and then the, the stats are there. I think the important thing is here that we, we attracted 100,000 females and 77,000 males. Of that, 54,000 were female youth and 37,000 were male youth. Um, and the, the estimated value of those applications that we received in which we watched very carefully because we only had a billion rand was then that 
766 million. We've got a few child-headed households. And okay, the next slide will, will work. Thanks. Um, this is just how we, we, we had two groups, basically. We had uh, 49,000, you'll see on the first card, group A, and then another 42,000, group B. But the 42,000 for group B was um, in the closing of the system within the 10-day period. There's a number of people that actually received um, reference numbers that um, should, well, they were supposed to re receive re reference numbers, but they received them after the system had closed. So those, those numbers then... Um, we added and then we had to basically go and verify 136,000 applicants of the 178,000 um, that we received initially. Important here is that we, we, we went through all the, the databases like all, all the colleagues pr previously said, we went and we checked the agricultural databases, we checked home affairs, we checked personal, we checked DSD, we, we, um, we looked at the military veterans databases, we checked our ID numbers, um, and, and so by doing that, we were then able to already, of the 178,000, we were able to immediately um, filter out, um, you know, nearly uh, 40, 45,000 people that didn't qualify. Obviously, then, we, there were a few things that we needed to do on the ground. And the next slide will then speak to that. Next slide. So on the ground, we put, we put this da da dashboard together. We used this ESRI Survey123 app. It's a, um, this is the ArcGIS database that you see. And this is the picture of the country as of the 3rd of October this year. Um, we, we had to, as you saw there, 136,000 people had to be visited. We had to get a copy of the ID. We had to get a geo-located um, um, property. We had to... Um, check their production. We had to get a, a signature from them. And once we had verified that these people were actually producing something, every dot that you see on this map in front of you, there's, there's 89,000. Well, I think today it's just gone over 90,000. There's 90, 89,000 dots as of the, th uh, the 3rd of October. And every single dot, if you click on that dot, it's geolocated and I can actually see who the person is, who the verifier was, what they're producing, et cetera, et cetera. So we've got that database now, um, which is very useful. We, once we visited everyone, you can go to the next slide. We then, we then went and put this through a, we, we developed um, as a department, a long-term system. So it had a district level committee that sat all those applications, the 90,000 go to the district levels at the various districts. They then verify that the ID is there, that the farming capability is visible, you know, and, and they check, they do a basic check. Then we send that information goes electronically through to a provincial office. The provincial office will sit, the provincial office will, will assess 20% of all the applications from all the districts. If they're happy with that, they send it through to national and at national we then do a verification of 5% of the total um, grouping for that province. So that's how we went about it. We, we've, we, we got no audit findings on the process, the systems worked out. <laughs> and as of the 1st of October, you will see here, we issued 53,000 um, vouchers. Um, and this is per province, the value of the vouchers, the redeemed amount, and you'll see there obviously the redemption rate is about 84%, which is not too bad. Um, however, it, it, we, we, we obviously are working at getting it higher. For every, every, in every single province, we have service points. There's 925 throughout the country. Um, and these service points were basically, we, because we sent somebody a voucher, it was a SMS voucher, they took the voucher, they went to a service provider, the service provider then gave them the goods to the value of the money of the voucher. And they then could use that voucher up to um, five times within a, uh, a given period. I think we gave them three months to use the voucher. Once the voucher was depleted, um, then obviously, and the goods were taken, we would then check the, the system with the, the, the supplier would then take their invoice. And what we did is we, we, we had a problem with within the department, you know, and I think many of the departments in South Africa would, would have this problem, is that when you start dealing with large amounts of invoices in a paper-based system, 
um, you can you can get to a point where that 30 day or 60 day payment rule doesn't doesn't work anymore. It's just too many too many invoices, too few people under COVID conditions, and we had problems um, where where people were really um, suppliers were complaining under the the COVID one the exercise I told you about initially. People were complaining that you know the department was paying too slowly or they didn't get payments. So we then contracted also through RT15. We contracted Vodacom. We created a suspense account. For every voucher that we put into the account, we gave an equivalent amount of money. Now, obviously, we didn't put one, one, one. We would do, uh, we would typically do ten thousand vouchers and then put the the, the the amount of money into the the suspense account. And then what Vodacom would do is Vodacom through their mezzanine um, payment platform, they actually paid the suppliers. And the suppliers generally got their, their money within 48 hours after they, the, the vouchers had been redeemed with them. Okay, then the next. Uh, I just wanna at this stage also make it very clear that this is a, we used, this is the, the procurement methodology that we used as the Department of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development. So we participated in contract RT15. Um, for voucher management, it, it became very simple. We, we, could, we could withhold, withhold any supplier that got um, flagged on us by any, of, by any of our provinces, by any of the farmers to say, look, this supplier has taken my voucher and he or she has not supplied me the goods, was then immediately flagged. It was literally an, an email and we immediately then block that supplier um, and then we, we withheld all payments to the supplier until they, they then show us through our provincial offices that they actually are delivering the goods and then we release that, um, that payment, um, we unblock them. So um, as you can see, I just took out the names there for copy purposes. Um, but you know, as of the 1st of October, there were 200,000 200, um, rands worth of um, uh, invoices had been blocked, waiting for those suppliers then to confirm that they have actually met their obligation and provided the farmers with the necessary inputs. Um, the table five there, you'll also see there were, every, every single supplier has a payment report. So we can actually see, um, if you look at the account name, there was T and T got already 26 million Rand, D got 10 million Rand. And so we have all 925 suppliers. We can see what they have, um, the number of vouchers they have redeemed. There's a lot of um, refinement that can be done on the system, but very often the, the system problems aren't the department's problems, but also it lies with the service provider. Okay, next slide, thanks. Okay, so findings from the intervention, I'm gonna add a few here. I just wanna go back to the, the positive outcomes from this is that one, we were forced by COVID to do things very diff differently and we were able to stimulate growth and awaken the subsistence producer sector. Uh, we have created a geofence database of subsistence producers. And as I showed you, there we have it. We've got at this stage 90,000 um, farmers that we can go to at any time. We have their cell phone numbers, their ID numbers. Um, and, and I like the previous presenters, you know, if we start getting to, into banking details, we really do, we will be able to um, considerably improve the way that we deliver services to these. Um, subsistence producers. Then um, we were very successful in targeting youth, women, and people with disabilities. Um, we, we met the targets. We, I think we did 57% of women were targeted. We made the youth target of 40% and the disability target. So those were achieved um, for the first time. I, I can't even imagine how long that we achieved that by, because in this sector, generally men take the spoils in everything. And it wasn't about men not getting um, any um, income men did get, and they were of youthful nature. But what what was important is that we actually change the way that households work, and we move the means of production from men to women. So in a household, instead of the man um, applying, the woman applied, and she got control over that financial or input um, in, into the household's um, livelihood. Um, yeah, then. The supplier, the supplier payment systems and voucher system makes for very fast delivery um, to suppliers and payments. Um, the system was welcomed by farmers and by suppliers. The suppliers love the system. 
and they are they were obviously issues around uh, farmers and suppliers and we also had a lot of criticism well what we thought was a lot of criticism on social media but um, if we actually go and look at the number of complaints we received out of um, let's say 50,000 um, vouchers that were issued uh, as of the 31st of uh, or the 1st of October you know we would typically only have got 200 complaints um, so so percentage wise the complaints are limited but it is also obviously where the complaint goes and how many people people leverage and some of the complaints are are just that they're just complaints people are not always happy they didn't read the terms of reference etc so we had a, a team that was dealing with that then obviously yeah i think uh, most importantly the use of technology benefited service delivery limitations um you know we we had to deal with a large number of of applicants in the 12 days that went to the ussd system um, the appointment of suppliers took a very long time because of a poor response from the private sector um, and we had to we actually had to go to the private three times uh, to call on for suppliers um, and half of that um, unwillingness of suppliers to um, come to the party was they didn't want to have the the same um, experience that they had with the department through the first COVID process where you know uh, of the 50,000 targeted we were only able to issue 15,000 vouchers and suppliers didn't get paid so um, I think we've turned that um, by the third call we went out the, the message was out there that the department is doing things differently it's going well and lots of suppliers then came on board say look no we also want to be part of this because we see the system actually it is working and we are, are getting our uh, funds in a very short turnaround time within 48 hours in most cases. Um, and then, yeah, okay, so that's that. And then we had um, Can I ask you to wrap up, Clinton, if you don't mind? 100%, the physical verifications and resources, um, it was, uh, of, uh, the physical verification took a lot of resources. Um, anyway, but it, it was necessary because we need to Geo geolocate, we need to get IDs, we need to get proof of production. And um, then the other thing that was, that was also limiting was that extension offices, um, and I'm, there is a process to get more extension offices in the country now, but the, the extension offices literally cannot deal with three large scale programs running in one financial year. The volume of the work um, under COVID conditions was extremely um, uh, large and it, it really put them under a lot of pressure uh, work wise. Okay, so yeah, that was basically the presentation and I thank you for your time. Thanks so much, Clinton. It's always, I've heard this before, it's always exciting to hear and, and see the developments that have taken place. Our last speaker, and not our least speaker actually, is, um, I shouldn't say, head of the South African Reserve Bank, it should actually say the South African Revenue Service, is Intikob Shaikh. He's actually head of ICT at SARS. Um, and um, Intercom, I understand you'll be flighting your own presentation, am I correct? That's correct, thank you. Super, thanks so much. I'm good to go, Mrs. Great, we can see it. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, I hope I can get my message across to you as best as can be, and I hope you enjoy the next few minutes. Um, so I think before you, you start to look at any uh, automation or digitization of any process, uh, be it payments from government to people or from people to government or any process that's related to that in a value chain uh, from registration to filing an application um, and checking certain key data elements within a banking detail process, you must understand why you're doing it. And from a SARS perspective, you know, we have... Uh, a new commissioner with a with a very visionary approach that has set us up um, to reach a very very audacious goal in, in, in by 2024, which is having a smart modern SARS with unquestionable integrity that is trusted and admired, and everything that one does 
or implements or delivers has to speak to this ethos. Um, so building on from that strategic uh, vision, there's a very, very clear compliance model that SARS uh, follows, which is uh, the backbone of our strategic intent. And it simply works on, on three pivots that say, people are generally compliant, uh, and if they are non-compliant, they either do not have clarity and certainty on what they have to do, or something that they need to do is not as easy uh, for them to use or comply with. Or thirdly, you just have a nefarious punch that are just totally non-compliant. So our compliance model basically says, for those who are unclear, let's provide clarity and certainty. For those who are compliant, uh, let's make it easy and seamless for them to do business with SARS. And for those who are non-compliant, let's detect them early and ensure that we make non-compliance very hard and costly. And that compliance model emanates into what are nine strategic objectives. And today I will just focus on the strategic objectives that um, talk to business processes and zone that down into the payments process. Um, so providing clarity and certainty, making it easy and detecting non-compliance are key business objectives. And those are enabled by two very strategic enabling objectives, which is using data uh, to enhance the taxpayer experience. And number two, having modern digital platforms uh, that provides, provide an easy and seamless online service. Now, once you understand those strategic objectives, you, you then have to understand <clears throat> what is the role and what is the enablement meaning of the technology and solutions delivery area. Now, our main objective is to ensure that in five years time, we have a 90% digital uptake. So 90% of our taxpayers and traders will be using digital platforms uh, to do business with SARS in a seamless and easy way that is clear and certain. Underpinning that, there's a whole lot of work or areas that need focus that need to be delivered. Um, so when we look at ourselves and we look at our digital assets, we say, what is the importance of those digital assets? And why is it key for the enablement of business objectives? And if you look at the numbers presented to you, you can see that you know, 99.5% of our money comes in and goes out electronically, which translates into some 1.26 billion rand. We've got hundreds of millions of transactions that are processed, and you have to ensure that you have a digital platform uh, that is trusted by taxpayers and traders out there in order to ensure that your uptake is, is high. Zoning that thinking from a strategic point of view into a payment model, SARS is in a very unique position in the, in the sense that we disperse and we collect. So we collect and then we also disperse money. And more importantly, what makes our job even more complicated is that we can collect from one tax, but pay out into another tax. So if you look at it from a customs perspective, uh, we collect customs VAT on any imports, but we pay that out on a VAT return, um, which is the customs duty is then put in as an input tax. Similarly, we have uh, PAYE or pay as you earn tax that is collected from employees, um, which is then paid out to the taxpayer on an individual basis on a personal income tax return. Uh, from a company uh, return perspective, we collect VAT, we collect customs duties, et cetera, and then we pay that out um, on, um, on a company income tax return. So the complexity from a payments point of view, from a SaaS perspective, 
is the ability to collect it all correctly and then to disperse it correctly. Uh, and we use a, a few payment methods uh, or collection methods, um, which are all electronic, which is, like I said earlier on, 99.5% of it is, is electronic. There are very, very few exceptions uh, with foreign bank accounts, et cetera, that need to be paid out in a different manner. But for the rest of it, it's, it's electronic. Um, just to give you an idea from a disbursement point of view, we pay out something like 290 billion rand worth of refunds in a year. Uh, our collection amount exceeds 1.3 trillion rand. So that's no chump change. And that's a lot of money that we have to handle. And we handle that electronically. Um, so that brings us to how did we get to where we are today from a collection and a disbursement point of view uh, from a payments perspective. So very early on in the year 2000, we first started having the requirement uh, to capture banking details on income tax returns. Because previous to this, we paid out money uh, via check, uh, et cetera, which was not very pleasant. And we used to rely on the postal system and people would file their returns. It would take some 120 days to process your return and then another six months before you actually got your refund. So we decided, look, the way to get electronic is to make sure that we have the data. That is uh, the predicate for any uh, electronic system. The blood flow is in fact the data. And the first data point was to get the banking details. Uh, we then went on to introduce the capability to be able to file tax declarations uh, electronically. And again, why? Um, you know, paper is more insecure. You know, we talk today in the IT world uh, about cybersecurity threats and IT security threats, but people need to just hop, hop back to the days when pieces of paper were lying on people's desks. Uh, and then people walking past could see very personal information. At least now that information is digitized, but the digital nature of the information allows you to do a lot more with it than you would be able to do with two pieces of paper because you can match that data. You can make sure the data that you've received corroborates with another set of data uh, and then you can make an accurate payment. So the idea was to, in an electronic fashion, get in the banking details and then on the submission uh, by the taxpayer done electronically as well, uh, put in these uh, banking details so that they could be matched and then payments could then be made electronically. So that was the very early start and the beginnings of the process. As we became mature, we, we realized that it's not as easy as taking two pieces of data and matching it. Uh, it's also about reconciling the fact that your receipts match up to your disbursements and your receipts that are, are sent into you by the taxpayers are in fact in the banks. Uh, so we introduced a, a reconciliation engine called the Copano Payments Engine, which what simply did was take all the transactions on a daily basis and actually matched in to the amount of money in the bank by the bank statements, which meant that the money that we thought we had in the bank, we actually had in the bank, because you cannot pay money out that you have not received. Um, and as those electronic systems got more and more efficient, we decided, well, cash is unsafe, not only for our staff, uh, but even just from a disbursement point of view, uh, to pay out cash could lead to corruption as well as to collusion and also uh, robbery at our branches, et cetera. So we decided to do away with cash holes. But in doing that, and making that payment process efficient and the reconciliation process efficient, we introduced what we call a payment reference number that tied up the actual payment that you made at the bank to the declaration that you made at SARS. And that similar payment reference number would 
reconciled to your actual tax account. And in your tax account, if you were due a refund, we would use the banking details on your tax account to pay the refund to you. And then <clears throat> where we are today, we've, we've also realized that um, unscrupulous entities can take advantage uh, of loopholes and data gaps in order to steal identities and lay claim or stake claim to refunds due to innocent people. So we realized that we have to put in uh, certain controls and make sure that the money we collect, for example, from an employer is in fact paid out to the correct employee. Uh, and we did this in various ways. Um, the one way was to collect third party data from institutions such as banks, uh, medical aids, uh, retirement funds, etc that we could use to corroborate any data that was declared to us in ensuring that the person making the declaration was in fact linked to the personal data that we had received from third parties. And obviously if that data was not linked, uh, we would have an inclination that this may or may not be the correct person, which would allow us to detect non-compliance. Uh, we also introduced uh, the AVS system, which said, once we are ready to make a disbursement to a person or to a taxpayer, we would verify by using the identity, the surname, and the bank account number to ensure that the bank account actually belonged to the person who was claiming the refund. In instances where, again, our risk profiling decided that there is a possibility that it may not be that person, we would then create a case on our service management system, which would then require an in-person verification that the person had to come into our branch uh, and then prove that it was he, him or her. Um, Later on, we started realizing that many people, when they file their tax returns, they would not declare uh, their bank account on their tax return, which would make the disbursement to payment reconciliation difficult. Uh, so we introduce as mandatory on any tax declaration, the completion of banking details, which meant that if you did not have banking details on your tax returns, your refund would not be paid into uh, a verified bank account and you would have to come to a branch to actually collect that money, which taxpayers very soon realized that we were making their life easier and started declaring uh, their bank accounts on their tax returns. I think in relation to the numbers today, we are in excess of 98% of all declarations that come in have bank accounts on them, except again, some few exceptions for foreign bank accounts, et cetera. Um, I just wanna take you to a short video that demonstrates how a person would make a payment to SARS as an individual. Once you filed your return, you would go onto our Mobi app, you would view the assessment we have, we have given you. It would tell you the amount of money that you are liable to pay to SARS. You would click on a pay now button and you would select the banking institution you would like to pay from. Uh, and then once you submit, the money would be automatically transferred to SARS. And when we get the banking statements, uh, we would then rec reconcile that on our Copano payments engine. So that's reflective of how easy it is to make a P to G payment to SARS. From a government to person process point of view, uh, it all works within the pipeline, which is centered around the entity and not in fact the process. The entity that owns the tax number, be it an individual, a company, uh, a VAT registrant, a PAYE registrant, a customs importer, etc., has to first register for a tax product. And when that registration happens, we verify your personal details, uh, like your IT ID number, 
your company registration number, etc., uh, against third-party data sources such as Home Affairs, uh, such as SIPSI. As a matter of fact, from a SIPSI perspective, we don't register any company that is not registered with SIPSI. We get a direct link from SIPSI and the company is automatically registered with SARS. So we don't have to do a double verification. It is in fact verified by SIPSI originally. In that process, we also verify your banking details. So our theory is that if your salary is paid into an account by your employer and they submit your IRP5 certificate to us with the same bank account, it means you are happy that that's your bank account. Secondly, we get some 125 million uh, financial certificates from banking institutions that tell us uh, the ID number and the bank account number and certain other personal details um, from, uh, from the personal uh, taxpayer or the company taxpayer. And we use that data, that point, to verify that the banking details you have submitted to us, in fact, belong to you. And if they don't belong to you, or we have an inclination with our risk tools that they may not belong to you, we actually ask you for a verification. In the past, we used to ask you to come into a branch. We've now enhanced uh, that process. And we use uh, a process where you provide to us a selfie, as well as a piece of paper showing the same day and the letter Jacob, I think I've sent. lost you is it just... sorry it's just you Kathy okay can I carry on yes, yes. Thank you. yeah and then if you submit that to us we then match that I can hear you. Will you just can I ask you to start carry opening on. up carry on you can okay. carry on if we can just Thank you. i'm going to give you two more minutes if you don't mind yeah i'm almost done um thank you uh and we match that data and then we create a case and we verify your banking details on filing your return we also verify those details again and once we are ready to pay out a refund we verify your banking details against avs and if everything is good to go uh, we pay out your 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 refund some of the key lessons that we can share with everybody is if you want to make uh, reconcile government to person and person to government payments, you have to have a unique key that matches, us, matches up the data. Number one. Number two, you have to have a very robust reconciliation process with the banks. Uh, from, a, from a personal perspective or personal taxpayer perspective, we found that many people change bank accounts in South Africa. Over the last 12 months, we've had 1.5 million banking detail changes, but you have to have controls by comparing to third party data, and you have to make sure you have security controls against fraudsters. Um, just looking forward very quickly, in our compliance model, we have to make sure that we find the balance between providing clarity and certainty, making it easy, but at the same time, having controls that fraudsters can not take advantage of. And being from KZN, I remember the story when they put down shark nets, it actually killed more dolphins than sharks. So if you don't find the balance, you could make it difficult for innocent taxpayers as well. Uh, just very quickly looking forward uh, in terms of strategic objective number five, we're looking to expand the use of our data. So we're looking at more third party data from government departments like the SARP and treasury uh, to look at tax compliance statuses. We, we intend having real time integration with financial institutions in the sense when new bank accounts uh, are open, we want it sent to us on a daily basis, which talks to the third point, we want more frequent submission of third party data. From an authentication point of view, we're looking at multimodal biometrics uh, a solution where you can do facial and fingerprint recognition. But lastly, um, I think which is a very important one, we've come to realize that artificial intelligence is actually augmented intelligence, where you have a data and technology driven authentication and verification 
auto case finalization process where the machine does the mathematical task, but the human being does the application of the mind task. So the empirical rules that come out of a human mind augment the machine and the, the, the statistical, mathematical and matching data that the machine can do augments the usage and the stewardship of very scarce resources. Uh, and just very quickly looking at expanding our footprint, we've noticed that the banks are closing their branches, but the retailers are opening more and more. So SARS is looking to make government to person payments and payment person to government payments through the retail outlets. Uh, and I think that is a wrap up on, on the SARS journey uh, in terms of the topic. Thank you very much for the time. I hope I was as clear as I could be. Thank you. That was an absolutely fascinating presentation and, and wonderful to see the progress that uh, SARS is actually making. Um, and I'd actually never realized how big SARS actually is. I think you're the largest P2G um, provider, but also the largest GTB provider. If we look at 1.3 trillion that's actually received and also in excess of 300 billion that's actually paid out. So, and that was a really fascinating presentation and we'd love to see where SARS goes on its journey next. Um, Alan, can I ask you um, just to have a few comments and then following your sort of insights on what you've seen, um, if I can ask Chris Hamilton to raise his two questions followed by Jason Wang. And then there were two questions, um, one from Arinda and another one for Sasa, if I'm not mistaken. But let's start off with, with Alan Gell. I, uh, I think it would be course. out of place uh, not to say that you earlier on heard in the audience that we have our esteemed commissioner. commissioner. He audience. yelled at me. Uh, so, so it, <laughs> it, it, do you want to maybe come in me. as well? It would be remiss of me to try and answer any questions outside of his wisdom. So I'd give him a shot first. <laughs> I know that's great. Okay. Alan, go ahead. And then I'll actually ask the commissioner maybe to come in and say a few comments. You're on mute, Alan. Okay. Can you hear me now? I can. Good. Yeah, thank you very much, Kathy, and thank you so much for the invitation to uh, join and to sit in. I must say it has been quite uh, an educative experience for me hearing about the innovations that uh, there have been in South Africa uh, across a wide range of fronts, uh, SARS, uh, agricultural vouchers, uh, G2P, social protection, and so on. And um, I mean, this is quite fascinating and as we look across not only South Africa, but other countries, some of the work we've been doing at the Center for Global Development on the use of digital mechanisms, it's clear that the COVID period has accelerated innovation, which was already ongoing in many ways. And uh, this is going to leave us with a legacy um, out of this very difficult period, which I think is a positive legacy on new ways to do things more efficiently and uh, more inclusively, hopefully. So uh, there's a lot to think of and thank you. Um, recently, we looked across countries at the use of digital mechanisms in the COVID period and um, how along the whole value chain uh, there was innovation going on in um, the application, the screening, the payment systems. And of course, many of what is happening in other countries is some parallels and some differences to South Africa, depending on the initial conditions. We do know, uh, World Bank cross-country studies, that the countries that have um, invested more in areas like ID systems, mobile systems, payment systems, some of the indexes we've been working on, have actually been able to scale up their systems more efficiently, which is, I think, what we would expect. And I think it's very interesting, uh, your experience in the question of digital screening for the SRD grant, because as, as you know, there were some countries that were already using multiple databases to screen and assess social protection, uh, Egypt, Turkey, Brazil, and so on. Um, but the COVID period has accelerated this and it's opening up towards a new concept, I think, of a social registry 
not uh, a static list of people based on a survey that might have been done 10 years ago of incomes and expenditures, but a dynamic list that is changing all the time based on continuous inputs. And where does this point us to? I don't think it points us towards a massive database. I don't think it's feasible to imagine a massive database built on this. What is more needed is the codification and streamlining of the um, uh, interoperability between different government databases and probably pushing countries towards something like an X-Road type system for the exchange of data across systems. Namibia, for example, has been working on this and I think they had quite an efficient experience in, in exchanging data across their systems for their own COVID relief grant. So I think that's where we're going. And of course, we'll also have to think carefully about the privacy and data security in that kind of system. I think this is going to accelerate movements there. And one issue I want to flag is costs. When I look at India, which is a country we've looked on a lot, I'm always struck by the focus on keeping costs low. Uh, whether it's costs of mobile data, efforts to force down data. I think South Africa is quite a high cost data environment. Um, the use of the ID system to uh, facilitate remote authentication uh, through multimodal biometrics, which has brought down costs in many areas, including uh, EKYC, uh, including all sorts of things. If you want to, let's say, register a change in a phone number, you can do it remotely. You don't need to go in and do it authentically. And I think that's a very important issue to consider is how your ID system, which is a good system, uh, is able to handle remote authentication. Uh, that is something that is coming. The next frontier, I think, very much is on this uh, question of the payments ecosystem. I think we're getting quite good across countries in terms of paying people electronically, although there are some people who it may be very difficult to pay electronically. But the real question is getting that to do more than simply expand the range of cash out points. In other words, um, because we find in country after country that these electronic systems result simply in different ways of transferring money, cash in the end to people. And um, I think a lot of countries are facing this challenge of expanding the payments ecosystem among small businesses and uh, small local businesses. And here again, um, it was very interesting to hear the innovations in South Africa, rapid payments. Um, again, taking the case of India, a very wide menu of options is coming in. I don't think their system of bank agents has been particularly successful, frankly. Some of the limits of the pure bank-based model. But now on the top of the um, universal payments interface, we have these innovations in consumer-facing interfaces uh, and the use of things like QR codes, which make payments very easy for small merchants. I think that's definitely the way in which the payment systems go. And if the payment systems can go in that way, then it will be possible for the G2P, the government payment systems, to become more than just cash transfer systems. If they don't go in that way, we will still be ending up with cash in the hands of these recipients. Mm -hmm. And the costs are, are vital in that area. Everything has to be done to bring down costs. Uh, I think we also see a number of trade-offs looking across countries. Um, uh, one is the, um, the, the tension you sometimes get between wanting a very rapid emergency transfer and building something for the longer term. Do you use one-off vouchers or do you use financial systems? That will work its way out post-COVID. We are definitely going towards financial transfers. Um, uh, controls and convenience. This was, I think, in the SARS um, one. Uh, I'm struck by the fact that some countries are much more relaxed than others in terms of uh, these transfers, whereas in South Africa, you have a very strong, I think, um, uh, prudential uh, environment here, the anti-fraud environment. It's quite strong. Another is the question of control versus market. Um, we're looking at the case of Kenya, where the G2P payments go through four banks. So there is some choice, but it's a constrained choice. Four banks for a variety of reasons, because the government, well, the government wants certain types of reporting and controls on its payment processes 
but then these accounts can be linked towards mobile money accounts, which are very widely held and where there's a very wide acceptance framework. So that's one model that we think is interesting. Finally, there are quite a few things that we don't know looking across countries. Um, we don't know much about exclusion at the fringes of the digital world. There is going to be some exclusion and uh, uh, we need to know more about it because ultimately these are the poorest people. Um, we don't know as much as I think we should know about the handling of complaints. I found the discussion here very interesting, but the nature of the feedback system and the complaints resolution is not always clear in countries. And I think we're also finding that as the programs and the payment systems become richer, they become more options, uh, more choice is at the, uh, on the side of beneficiaries, there's also often a need for more information. And uh, you can confuse people as well as giving them choices. And that's something that quite a few countries are trying to work their way through. So let me not say any more because of time, but thank you very, very much. There's a huge amount to think about. Thanks so much. And then that was very interesting and some very uh, useful food for thought. Commissioner, can I ask you to maybe say a few comments? Um, if that's okay, if I can put you on the spot. Thanks, Kathy. I expect nothing less of you. <laughs> uh, I have to say, before I go in, I want to say a big thank you. When we started the SASA SRD 350 grant, just so that, that people in the room know, we asked SARS to stitch the database together for SASA, and they did it in five days. So um, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm always indebted to you for that. Thank you. And, and it was really interesting to see the, uh, the perspectives from various uh, um, role players. Uh, and also thank you for to my colleague, uh, Intikab Sheikh, who I, I think uh, acquitted himself uh, very, very well. I couldn't have done uh, it as well as he does. I often remind him I'm just a talking head. But Cathy, so I think this is a great conversation, uh, long overdue. Um, and I'd like to, to uh, really encourage, and since you um, represent the project office in the presidency, it's the right place to start this conversation. We will not succeed unless we have a whole of government approach. Um, and, and that is an important principle. So for example, some of the prerequisite enablers can only be done if SARS can't achieve it as well as government can. Uh, and some of these, for example, is just identity management. We have countries mm -hmm. like Sweden, where when you are born, you get a number. And that number is your entire number that identifies you through your entire life. Uh, in Chile, um, you get a, 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 an identification number when you're born and that number is your credit card number. It's your bank number. You don't need another number to identify you. The entire system uh, um, identifies you through only one number. Um, in Singapore, increasingly their NRIC, their, their identity number, uh, is you, you cannot move without quoting your, your, your NRIC number, whether it is in a retail store, even signing up to a loyalty program, you need that number. Um, any money transfers, uh, whether it's in the banking system or in the retail system. Uh, so, and only government can achieve that. And we are way behind uh, really just saying, we're going to, we, I mean, we've got a tax number for every tax type for heaven's sake. Then we've got a company number, then you've got an ID number. Uh, they, so we want to do away, for example, with a tax number for an individual and just use their ID number. But that momentum must be driven by government. That's one of the enablers. The second enabler is legislation. Uh, sometimes we want to help. You know, when you come begging to us to help, very often it is our mandate that, that stops us from helping you. So we are created by law only to collect taxes and to disperse refunds. But if you think about what we do genetically, we are the biggest collector of money probably in Africa and the biggest disperser of money probably in Africa between governments and society, which means that we have the capability to collect and disperse money regardless of what is the generator of that money, whether it's uh, a tax obligation or any other obligation. Um, and then the last, uh, the, the third enabler 
is um, a unified platform. So for example, SaaS can go ahead and develop blockchain as a distributed ledger. But why should SaaS do that? The whole of government should just make a decision around blockchain for, I'm just using blockchain as a, a, as a, a, a proxy for a, a really uh, um, high fidelity distributed ledger. That's perfectly reconcilable all the time. Uh, that, man, that tracks the stocks and flows of any uh, transaction. And then the last point that only government can do is to make a decision about cash. Cash is the biggest problem for us. If you, if you know the, 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 the whole story about black bags of money going from one boot of a car to another boot is only made possible because so many transactions are still uh, um, done in the cash economy. And as well, we have a growing cash economy. We, we're never going to have a high fidelity system. So, so my, my only contribution as a generic contribution is we need a whole of government approach that really in with indecent haste, put in place the enabling environment that allows a SARS or any other uh, government entity to perform its, uh, its work. Thank you. That's actually, I almost would end the presentations there. I think that is, um, I think it's an excellent summary of where we need to go and where this process actually needs to take us. So Commissioner, thank you very much for, for those very useful and very powerful insights actually, as always. Um, I'm just going to quickly do a quick round of questions there, Jason. Um, I see Nalima has left us. Chris, do you want to ask your question quickly to, um, I think it was a more general comment, and then if Jason can ask his question to Clinton, and then um, whatever questions have not been answered, if you can send them to us, we'll actually distribute them to the speakers since we have run out of time and we will address your questions. And then just to remind you that we've got a present the next sort of webinar series in about two weeks time. Chris, over to you. Thanks, Cathy. I, um, look, in the interest of time, I just wanna reinforce the observation I put into the, to the chat really, which is that the big design issue in getting these complex interplay of networks to work is the interfaces, is where is the interface in the process and what data will flow across it. And that, that design choice has massive consequences because you can't go back and change it later. Once you've done it, everyone goes away and designs relying on that core assumption. So maybe we're kind of setting ourselves here, and this is a great conversation, a really exciting conversation. Um, if, if we set ourselves a goal of maybe coming up with what those big interface points are in the South African system, that would be a, um, you know, a wonderfully powerful outcome from this set of conversations um, that would then enable a whole lot of subsidiary work to go on within a framework that's been set. So, so the question that I asked was, has the World Bank got expert guidance on where you put those interfaces in these complex uh, interacting networks and and can we learn more from that because I think I get the point about interaction um, about interoperability what you can't do is, is build a single unified system that's never going to work so you have to you have to understand where the interplay is going to be so if, if there's an ability to answer that question now that's great but it's really setting a target for the future I think thanks Julian can I put you on the spot to maybe answer that if you're in the room no, that's a bit unkind. I think he's not here. Um, so that's fine. Um, I think that's a very important point, Chris. And I think that's something that we should think about as we go through these payment series. I mean, the point that the commissioner made about digital identity has come up before, right? We've seen it in the various presentations, how important it is, but it was raised in the session again last week to actually say, digital identity and how you sort of have this unique number which allows for system interoperability and information to be shared starts to become a very powerful lever. Um, and I think we'll definitely speak to our, our um, World Bank colleagues to see what they can, uh, or what advice they can give us around this. And I think it's something that post this webinar series, we need to start thinking about, I mean, beyond this, what do we do as a country in terms of digitizing payments? Um, Jason, can I ask you to, I think you had a question for Clinton, if I'm not mistaken, and one for Karen. Jason, yeah, you're on yes. mute. Oh, great stuff. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, uh, so I, um, 
I had two questions. The first one was for Nalima, and the second was for Clinton. So I'm going to ask um, the question, repeat the question to Clinton. So, and I think where I was thinking about this was, so information building and data building is usually there's a journey for it. And when Clinton, and from what I heard from Clinton and he, the story that he shared, I was, there was a process where the suppliers, uh, there was a need to build up the suppliers and the suppliers to sign on. And I was kind of wondering if I was a farmer or if I'm a payer, I'm a payer, is there a way for me to um, identify or um, identify or find out who are the farmers or the suppliers that I can actually take this voucher to, that I can actually use it? And I don't know if that if it was applicable to in their environment, but I think from a, in in a very sort of a, a wide network environment, I think it's uh, for a payer it would be nice to understand or know where they can go to access or use certain payments, or until I think sort of that that complete that end state can be completed. Otherwise, you know, if someone has to reach someone, they say they can't use it. I think that raises that opportunity cost for them. So yeah, so it's just a course sort of question, my question to uh, Clinton and to understand their journey. Super, and Karen, Marinda, and uh, Marinda, do you wanna ask your question about the SASA? Marinda, I can't really hear you, but essentially the question to Karen is um, why registration at Postbank? So I'm just going to ask Karen and Clinton and Intercarb to give like one sentence to close off, maybe answer the questions and then just close off so that we can actually wrap up the session. Clinton, starting with you and then we'll go to um, Karen. All right, thank you. Thanks, Jason, for the question. I think the Vodacom system that we used then did provide every single farmer that got a voucher with the three closest suppliers to them. Um, so they could basically call those suppliers and they could then um, access those suppliers. But there was then later on a full database of all the suppliers sent to the, the provincial offices, which if anybody had a problem with, they could contact um, the provincial office and they could get a full list of the suppliers. Thank you. Thanks so much, Clinton. Karen? Just the on the question to Postbank. Okay, so um, initially when we <clears throat> started with the system in terms of the, the very short lead times we had, uh, we made um, use of our emergency procurement where we also then look at suppliers that's within the environment. As I've indicated, we also used our biometric environment. So um, uh, Postbank um, is one of our service providers and hence at that stage we made use of of them. Um, when they open an account for us, obviously then um, you can immediately tie the account details to that client because we get it directly from, from Postbank and it doesn't have to go through an account verification process at that stage as it is directly. Any other payments that we are making to Postbank where clients provide us with bank details, those go through the, the um, account verification, but not when um, uh, Postbank opens the account because because it's directly from them to us, and then we provide the, the client with, with their accounts in, in, in that regard. So um, that's why we've used Postbank. However, we are reaching out also to um, the banks um, um, at the moment in, in, in the environment to also see how we can possibly leverage from account opening um, with, with banks and, and other service providers. Thanks, Thanks so much, Karen, for that. So I'm just going to close off briefly with a quick sort of summary and some food for thought for the next sessions that we're going to go through. We've got digital identity that we're interested in looking at and thinking about. We've got big design issues and looking at data interoperability and system interoperability. The commissioner also talked about a uniform platform and obviously changing the legislative mandate in some instances that government needs to take responsibility for this and actually drive the mandate. And we've seen in other countries that 
um, and also the comments from Alan, you can actually see when government takes a particular point, uh, a focus point on how to actually drive payments, you actually start to open up the ecosystem. So I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you very much for joining us and for the indulgence of the extra 17 minutes. Um, as I indicated, we will be sending an evaluation out if you can send us some feedback so that we can make sure that the um, sessions that are coming up are actually geared and tailored specifically for some of your needs. So thank you very much for your time. Have a wonderful afternoon. Um, as per usual, the presentations and the uh, recordings will be shared on our website and a link will be shared with you. And so thank you very much and see you in two weeks time. Take care and stay safe.